Well, my name is Travis Doucette, and I'm thrilled to be here today with my friend Paul Balash. Paul, you've been recording with Integrity Music for over 30 years, longer than any other artist in their stable. You are the songwriter behind dozens and dozens of worship songs that people know so well. Hosanna, Above All, and Behold Him, just to name a few. You're also um, the composer behind many songs that other people have covered, songs like Revival Fire, Fall by Lindell Cooley, and Sing Out by Ron Canoli. Celebrate the Lord of Love by Don Moan. I could go on and on. You're a pastor, an artist, a songwriter, an <laughs> author, a teacher, a grandpa, and my friend for about 20 years. Paul, it is so great to hang out with you today. How are you doing? Thank you. Good, Travis. <laughs> Travis, that's so encouraging. You know, some days you wake up and feel like, what have I done with my life? I feel like I haven't done anything. So every once in a while, I'm going to play this back and go, oh, yeah. yeah I tried to do a couple things. For sure, for sure. Well, man, I'm so excited to spend some time with you. Let's uh, let's like dive right in. Prior to your recordings with Integrity, I know that your life intersected with a number of people that were pioneers of Christian music, just in some really interesting ways. And I know that in drives to the airport and in other times where our lives have intersected, I've so enjoyed just kind of learning about the path that the Lord brought you on, even as he was bringing you to Lindale, Texas. And I'm just wondering if you could talk about that season and some of those meaningful relationships that were, uh, you know, shaped and and cultivated during that time. Mm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, uh, where do you begin? A lot of the names, um, anyone that's maybe under 30, unless they had parents <clears throat> who had like Keith Green records or Silver Wind, um, second chapter of Acts, Dallas Home. I mean, these were the these were the bands who sort of created it. There wasn't a thing called contemporary Christian music. Nobody had put a <clears throat> had put a label on it quite yet. <clears throat> Forgive me, my uh, <clears throat> my last sip of coffee had that half and half. Uh, <clears throat> this would not be a good time to do a vocal in the studio. <clears throat> um, yeah, so a lot of those bands that I just mentioned, it would be like me mentioning. Uh, for King and Country, Casting Crowns, Mercy Me, and you know Michael W. Smith, let's say, um, you know Keith Green. Um, there, there was not a music industry. I mean, Nashville was you know country music. Um, there was maybe some Southern gospel here or there. Mostly people were singing hymns. Um, Maranatha music in Southern California came out of the Calvary Chapel movement. So Maranatha music, like praise one, praise two, praise three, you know, it gets sings them. There was a, it was something other than hymns. And that was really kind of fresh at the time. And then out of that movement came the vineyard movement. And so it was similar sort of to Calvary Chapel, but vineyard was a bit more of the expression of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, more of an emphasis on the experiential aspects of the Holy Spirit and experiential worship. So then that became kind of another stream around the late 70s, early 80s. <clears throat> I became a Christian in 1980. Before that, I you know, grew up outside of Philadelphia and was in, you know, playing some club bands, rock bands at the Jersey Shore and that sort of thing. And then became a believer. And so this was all brand new to me. And I remember ending up at, a, <clears throat> at an Assembly of God church and just People were just singing like they really meant it. I'd never seen this before. Like, in him we live and move and have a Lord God. Thou was made the heavens and the... But not only that, then some powerful ballads too, you know. Majesty, worship his majesty. Just classics, right? That just, ah, oh, my first tastes of that corporate worship that just were so... Uh, compelling and just so, uh, you know, the presence of God, experiencing that. And then that led me to finally go, I, I, I want to be, where's, who's doing stuff like this? So sure enough, Southern California. And I loaded up my little Toyota Celica and went to Southern California, didn't know anybody and decided I wanted to do a music school, like a one-year music school, get a part-time job on the side and, uh, I remember going to it. This is an interesting little 
side note, I remember going to this Christian bookstore. I'd only been there about a month and a guy named Michael W. Smith and Amy Grant were going to be doing a signing at this bookstore, Christian bookstore, which is all kind of new to me. I remember going there and I met him. And this would have been whatever album, uh, Great is the Lord, da, 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 whatever that was back then. And, uh, you know, little did I know many years later would actually get to work with, write with Michael. And uh, um, again, so I, get, I had no clue whatsoever, just sort of naive. I went out to Southern California to do a music school. Uh, there was a singer named Michelle Pilar that I helped put a concert together here in the Northeast. And she had said one time, hey, if you ever, uh, you know, come out to California, maybe you could play guitar with me. So I actually, in the back of my mind, how naive, thought, hey, I'll call Michelle. And I remember when I got to California, like trying to find her number or whatever and calling, hey, hey, Michelle. Yeah, I'm the guy from Jersey. Remember that concert you guys did with the Imperials? And yeah, and you'd said like, hey, if you're ever in California and, and boy, I could just hear like silence. And um, I just knew like, yeah, that was just one of those things. Sometimes people in their kind, in their kind, in that moment of kindness, just go, oh yeah, sure, come on out. Yeah, sure, yeah, well, you know, but they don't ever think it's gonna happen. So that was a little humbling on my part, but I learned that, hey, you know, that's okay. She didn't promise you anything. So I went to a music school. Oh, wow, anyway, I ended up in that music school because the first Sunday that I was there in California, I went to this church on the way. Jack Hayford, he's the writer of the song Majesty, but he was on the radio. I'd heard him on this AM radio station, and I thought, I'm going to go to that church. And uh, man, I went, and it's a couple thousand people. I, oh, amazing. People are singing like they really mean it. I'm just like somewhere in the middle of the church and row 14, who knows, right? And at some point after worship, uh, Pastor Jack gets up and says, well, let's take a moment and greet one another and say hello. And so I turn, and this lady says, hi, my name's Stormy my husband Michael and um oh hi I'm Paul yeah I just got here like two days ago and I'm uh tomorrow I'm gonna go sign up for a music school and, and the guy Michael says oh where I said I think uh MIT Musician Institute of Technology it's called GIT Guitar Institute and he goes yeah yeah hey you ought to check out a school called Dick Grove School of Music you're a little bit more you know a little bit more serious I'm like huh Oh, okay. All right. Hey, well, nice to meet you guys. Thanks. That's it. Okay. So the next day I went to both schools and I ended up going to Dick Grove School of Music, which Dick Grove was a famous jazz arranger in the 60s, wrote songs for TV and movie and film and all this. And then he started a school and a whole like music theory, composition, arranging, uh, a whole approach to theory. It was called modern theory, modern arranging, modern harmony. And he was just a brilliant guy who would teach. He would just chain smoke. He would sit in class on a stool, white beard, and just, and just chain smoke and just teach. You know, amazing looking back. And uh, so I went to that school. Well, then over the next month or two, I'm in a Christian bookstore and I come across these books with a name called Stormy. Stormy O'Mardian. It was a book on prayer and fasting. I'm like, oh, that's the lady. That's the lady that I met that Sunday. Oh my goodness. And then come to find out, oh wait, her husband, Michael, wait, Michael O'Mardian? You mean the guy that played with Steely Dan and produced Christopher Cross? You know, sailing takes me away. Where da, da, da. And many other. So just that, boom, right off the bat. What a God moment. Like, how else could that be? That's beyond a coincidence. Out of a couple thousand people, God would put me right next to them in a 30-second encounter. It would affect what school I went to, et cetera. So then I heard on the radio, hey, this Friday, open house with, this, with Kelly Willard. And I remember, oh, yeah, I remember hearing that girl on the radio. She does nothing but the blood. And uh I'll go there. I didn't know anybody. So literally I'd been in California, maybe two weeks at the most. I go to this church, they put a label, you know, a little, uh, my name, a little uh, label there. 
And uh, says Paul, and I go up to this guy, Dan. I'm talking to Dan for 20 minutes. Such a nice guy talking to him. All of a sudden, walk, up walks this girl, and she has a little name tag. It says Kelly. And he goes, oh, Paul. so Paul, this is Kelly, my wife. Oh, you're Kelly Willard. Oh, man. So nice to meet you. Yeah, I heard your song in Philadelphia on the radio. And, and so we got to talking, blah, 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 blah. And then next thing you know, they're like, hey, if you ever want to come down, just hang at our place you know, just come on down on a weekend and just come hang out on Saturday. And like, that's great. Thank you. That's, that's awesome. So long story short, I would begin to, when I was able to drive down Santa Ana, which was in Orange, Orange County, I was living around in Pasadena at the time in a three bedroom house. It was two bedrooms already occupied. And my, I had a mattress on the floor of where the washer and dryer would go. That was my bedroom. It was basically a closet with a mattress on the floor. And I found a job uh, refinishing gymnasium floors where you'd like uh, take off the old polyurethane, you'd redraw the lines, you'd repaint it, and then you'd put that stuff back on the shiny polyurethane. Anyway, but when I could, I'd go down there and just hang out at their house. And, you know, sometimes I'd mow the lawn. Sometimes I'd bounce one of their kids, Brian, who is now just a beautiful man who ended up playing bass with Matt Redmond for many years, Brian Willard, who lives in Nashville. He's a beautiful young man with three kids of his own. And, but yeah, he was just, uh, and just learned, just I watched them like do ministry and family. And she would say, Hey, I have to sing a, I've got to, you know, run by the studio and just do a project. Then I have to go pick up groceries. You want to come with me? I'm like, sure. So we'd go by white, white, was it Whitehall Studios, where they recorded all the Maranatha albums and many Vineyard albums. And she, I, there's some classic songs that if I threw out, Travis, you would know them. Um, but I was there in the control room just as her little friend from New Jersey, you know, listening to her, which would later become like, you still hear them on the radio, classics. Um, um, trying to just think of one right now, but... Um, Oh, you are the vine. Oh, yeah. We are the branches. Da, da, da. Keep us abiding in you. But she sort of did a, a like a radio version. But she was so not impressed. Her and Dan, they were not trying to be part of the Christian music business. Uh, there was definitely, you could feel that tension of, there was like a scene. There was like a whole sort of concert thing going on. Like everything was... And, and little by little, she'd ask if I would play guitar with her on some of these things she'd get asked to play on. And uh, right before we would go on stage, she would just say, I'm just troubled. I feel such an expectation to be like, ta-da. So she said, you know, instead of coming out and doing like a big, how about, how about we just, what if we just did this song first? We'll come out and I'll just... And it was always sort of like a way to sort of pull out the rug of like, you know, people are like, come on, entertain me. Like, subconsciously they're not thinking that and it's not a bad thing but just everything in her spirit was i don't want to like go out there and just like be this like hey what's up everybody Woo! you know which is not a bad thing but but i just observed her desire to bring something um just something uh, Why does that hit me? Um, something authentic, something pure, so, at least, you know, in her, not that the other wouldn't be, you know, I don't want to judge other people. Again, you go to a Toby Mac thing, for example, and be like, he's just amazing. He was born to do that. And it's amazing. And he brings such joy and celebration. So I'm just, he, he comes to mind. But then there can also be this other thing where it's just a little bit too like, hey, hey like strange dynamic. And not more, more of a transparent, authentic ministry. So she would come out and everybody would be like, and it'd be like, Kelly Willard. And she'd come out and be like, hi. And she'd say, she'd walk over to the piano, just put the mic there and just like start playing something sort of quiet and go, can we just sing this song together? I cast all my cares upon you. Lay all of my burden. Oh my gosh, I'd be there just like. Whew. Ooh. 
man, the presence of God many times was, was just so palpable and uh, so, so real, tangible, so tangible. Uh, man, I learned so much just observing her and Dan, just their desire to be real and authentic and unpretentious. And uh, so I just so I'm thankful for their example. And uh, so then they, she had sang on some Kel, uh, Keith Green albums back in the day. Somehow their paths had crossed. And uh, if you look on some of the liner notes of some Keith Green records, it'd be oh Kelly Willard, yeah. Yeah, she uh, wrote and sang, uh, I want to be more like Jesus from the So You Want to Go Back to Egypt project. It was great. And then she does a great version of like, how can they live without Jesus? Right. How can they live without God's love? Um, so I'm sorry if this is too long. I went more detail, but I thought it was relevant. Um, they eventually on one of her sort of, uh, she was asked to go, she would do concerts and she, she ended up in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, Florence, Alabama, at a church where Lenny LeBlanc was. And she fell in love with the pastor and his wife and the, the pastor's wife and, the, and Lenny and just the whole vibe just seemed so, so she, after a few months, just was like, I really want to move there. I really want to be part of that church. So I helped them load up the truck and we drove to Alabama. And uh, I remember, uh, you know, unpacking the truck and your Lenny said, hey, if your friend wants to stay with me, you know, I got an extra bedroom, he can just stay with me. So, so I remember being in Lenny LeBlanc's guest bedroom, kind of looking up at the ceiling and, and remembering a couple of years prior, like one of some of the first music I ever heard on Christian radio, on this AM radio station in my car was Lenny LeBlanc and Michelle Pilar. It was a song they did together. And, you know, Lenny was kind of a big deal, open for Leonard Skinner back in the day and then got born again around 1980, 1981. So did a Christian album. And just, again, another unpretentious, humble, transparent. And so we'd watch him lead worship at church on a piano or guitar. And uh, I used to record on a cassette tape. I would get the cassette tape of the worship and I would practice the way Lenny would lead. I would practice just from beginning to end, I would like copy the whole set in my own private, like learning how to gain confidence and learning how to like, okay, how he went into that song. That's interesting. Oh, that's, oh, how he did that. Oh yeah. Yeah. And uh, man, I'm just thinking about that now, just how, how many of those little cassette tapes from Faith Tabernacle that I had that I would play and um, certain songs. And then, um, so I went back to California, finished up school. Eventually, Kelly and Dan said, move out here. I moved out there in Muscle Shoals, lived with them for six months. All the while, I'm in touch with my friend Rita back in New Jersey, who Rita would send me cassette tapes of just her. She would write like a little chorus, her and an open tuning acoustic guitar. And I would play them for Kelly. And Kelly would be like, oh, I love her voice. Oh, Dan, listen to her voice. I want her to sing on my next album. Oh, I just love the... Uh, and the song she had written, Rita had this little song on acoustic guitar. I will celebrate, sing unto the Lord, sing to the Lord. And Kelly was like, oh, I just, I love that song. So Kelly had the cassette tape in her kitchen and she would put it in the player sometimes and just play it. And I would say to Rita, we weren't, Rita and I weren't even dating or anything at the time. We're just friends, really good friends. But I'd say, hey, Kelly, please some of these songs you and she wants you to sing on her next album so sure enough they flew rita down to nashville she sang on uh uh this project what was it uh message for from a king wow what an album i really got to watch from beginning to end that whole process that was like that was like a college university experience just going from beginning watching the songs get birth watching them they get, get fleshed out rearranged going into the studio, watching it you try this way, try that way, we just to the final mix. That was amazing. Message from a King. And you can, you can find it on Apple Music. The lyrics are so convicting. Some of the songs are just amazing. So it's really cool to hear how your life intersected with uh, Dan and Kelly Willard. I also know that, you know, when you got to Texas, there was some significance in terms about where you lived in proximity to where 
Keith Green and Last Day Ministries was, and even where Second Chapter of Acts had their Easter Song Studio. Uh, talk yeah. to us a little bit about that and the, those relationships. Yeah, so after Muscle Shoals, I moved back to Jersey, got married, uh, was painting some apartment complex for six months, and I got a club gig, like some old friends were like, hey, three nights a week, it's a wedding band. It was fun to be playing again, so Rita would work Red Lobster during the days. I'd work uh, clubs at night, or if we were lucky, you'd get a Saturday wedding and make 250 bucks, you know. Um, and then Kelly and Dan kept persisting, saying, you guys should move to Texas. You guys should come down here. You guys should come down. And uh, We'll do this. We'll tour. We'll this. And you can this. Rita can sing. <clears throat> so after about a year here in Jersey, we... We made the, there's some God things in between, but I'll skip that. And just, we loaded up our Ford Escort and <clears throat> Rita, had, yeah. So we moved down there and um, lived in Keith and Melody's motor home. So not, not a mobile home, but a motor home, you know, with wheels on it. And it was, there was a, um, I remember an extension cord from, for electricity that came out of the motor home into Dan and Kelly's mobile home. And it was called Trailer Acres. It was on the back, the last day's ministries. But if you went through the woods, there was about 12 trailers kind of like uh, dotted, you know, every so often. And so Melody said, well, they can stay in our old motor home. And, was, you know, it was nothing fancy. But we were there for a couple months. And then another mobile home opened up and we moved into that. That was exciting. And, uh, and all our meals were in common there at last day's ministries. And, uh, you know, you'd have the cafeteria there. And then, so we did a, uh, what was called an ICT, an intensive Christian training. It was like a discipleship training thing. We did that. Uh, got to know Melody Green a little bit through Dan and Kelly, who they had, they'd been friends for years and Keith was already gone by then. Um, the plane crash had happened years prior. So, uh, but last day's ministries was still printing tracks. And then Bob Ayala, a blind, you know, artist who was part of Last Days Ministries for many years. He had a little studio at Last Days. And uh, anyway, I remember doing a few demos there. And he encouraged me. He said, Paul, the more you sing, the more you do demos, the better you'll get, the more confident you'll be. Just the more demos. And the... Okay. Yeah. The more you record yourself, the better you are. Okay. <clears throat> so, yes. Um, so where Last Days Ministries was, then eventually Dan and Kelly bought this little piece of property that was available next to Last Days and across the street from um, second chapter of Acts, where they had built this metal building and inside was a studio, Easter Song Studios. <clears throat> and um, Matt and Deanne actually lived, Matt Ward lived also in a mobile home a little bit. You know, you could kind of look through the woods that way. It was all just woods and, but Buck and Annie's place was beautiful. They even had a racquetball court inside and they had a bus barn because they were traveling. Second chapter of Acts were one of the first like touring Christian acts, if you will. Second chapter of Acts. And they toured and they had this bus and uh, <clears throat> Buck was the, the chief engineer and the manager and all that. And I mean, they were just figuring all this out. Nobody had done this before. <clears throat> so it was amazing to be around them be inspired by them. Uh, Dallas Holm was also in the area. Dallas was huge back then. I mean, he was like the Michael W. Smith or Stephen Curtis Chapman, if you will, of won all kinds of double awards, had big songs. And, but he was with uh, Wilkerson, Dave Wilkerson. So he, Dallas Holm's band would do the music and Dave Wilkerson would preach. And, uh, they traveled all over the U.S. and uh, on buses and so yeah, I got to know that community. And then there was the community church there that Keith didn't necessarily start, but it was basically a metal building, like a warehouse um, that people would meet on Sundays. And it was just a little PA system. And, you know, sometimes a pastor would preach or, but it was not, it was very loose and informal and a lot of YWAM people and others would, would join in. And uh, that's when, um, that's where I started, you know, eventually saying, hey, I, I can play guitar. If, you need a guitarist, so I sort of sit in on Sundays, and, and then a, within a few months, my the pastor at the time for about a year, he was there for about a year. He said, hey, Paul, why don't you come and lead us in a few songs? 
we're going to have a time of prayer. And I've shared that before. That was such a new thing for me. I didn't like lead worship. I was just like a guitar player for bands and for people and for people that could sing. I wasn't the guy that went up to the mic. I was like, okay, let's, uh, but that was it. And he, uh, he just put me on the spot and, and then said, Hey, why don't you do this? We can't really pay you much, but we could give you like $50 a week and you can have that closet. You can empty that out behind the, the platform there. And you can kind of make that a little office and maybe put a band together and see what the Lord does. I remember him saying that. And uh, so that is how, and then I, there was a band called Harvest and they were, an amazing band, a lot of albums. They toured all over. Um, they were on the radio all the time. Harvest, if you look them up. Was that with John Thompson and Randy Scruggs? No. Harvest was uh, Jerry. Oh, my goodness. The lead singer, the main guy, Jerry something. But the keyboard player and vocalist, they had great three-part harmonies. Real oh, tight. this is Ed Carr's band. Ed Carr. Yes. So I feel bad, Jerry, my gosh, everybody knew Jerry. He was the front guy. He was so like intense and passionate. Jerry. Yeah, but Ed was more, you know, keyboard guy, more uh, int introverted. And uh, he would play piano at the church where we would gather. And he was not married at the time. And uh, he was like mid thirties, maybe late thirties. Um, and we became friends. It was just a guy that, hey, let's hang out once in a while. Maybe we could jam. And I remember him saying, what, what's that? What do you mean jam? Well, you know, just jam. Like, well, we'll just jam out. And he's like, well, what do you mean? Well, like a blues thing. And uh, this is a guy with a master's in piano performance from Anderson University in Indiana. You know, I mean, he's just like a brilliant, can play anything you put in front of him. But he'd never, I said, well, you know, look, I'll just play like gunk, 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 gunk. And you just sort of like, you know, just, just do a little improvising. He'd never done that. And I was like, well, okay, here's like, I don't play piano, but here's like a blues scale, like bam, 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 just those notes. Bam, bam, bam. And he's like, okay, of course he had the, so and I'll just play a groove and then you just sort of play with those notes. And, you know, before you know it, of course, he's like, dun, 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 dun. amazing. He was just brilliant. And so he brought this real classical background thing. And then I sort of had more of a street club rock and roll kind of guitar vibe and so it was fun to to kind of work together and become friends and then we decided hey wouldn't it be cool to uh to write some song to write a song on that what pastor what he preached on last week and ed would say i got the song idea he, ed was more in the beginning like an initiator he would say yeah i've got a song idea he would take a scripture and i was just like in awe like that's amazing and I think that planted seeds for me, like, that's, that's how you do it. And so we went to the bank, we both completely broke, and we got a loan for $5,000. We bought a 16-track reel-to-reel recorder, Fostex, and we put it in that room behind, in the church. It was like a, a closet, like a large closet. And, uh, and that became our little, we just said, want to meet here a couple times a week. Let's see whenever we can and maybe work on some songs and songs that we could do for our church. This was way before there was a CCLI. There was no worship industry. It was just for our church. The goal was simply, let's write songs for our church. Wouldn't it be cool if we take some of like pastor's ideas or some of the prayer things, people, things that people are praying about and we like put it in a song form that we could sing, you know? And we began to do that. And uh, we began to demo these songs. And uh, add on piano and I'd play the guitar and we'd do vocal. And sometimes, you know, um, maybe we'd add background vocal parts. We'd bring Rita in. And um, yeah, um, man, this probably doesn't, I'm, I'm going, these are long answers. I'm sorry, bro. No, you're fine. You're doing great. Let me ask you, how did you become involved with the Maranatha Praise Band? Because I know that kind of predated or almost kind of simultaneously was happening while the integrity thing was happening. And what were some of the formidable lessons that you learned as a worship leader and songwriter that were shaped by that early time with Maranatha? Yeah, so I was really into Maranatha, the Praise Band. I thought it was just had an edge to it. It was guitar rock. The integrity Hosanna thing was nice. It was cool. 
but it was a lot of keyboard. You know, I'm 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 just being super general, but it was it was cool and it was amazing and it was transforming this live worship experience. But there was something personally that I resonated with, sort of this more guitar based. Uh, those first two albums that Rita ended up, they came out, they, Maranatha came out, Tommy Coombs and those guys came out to Buck and Annie's studio, Easter song, and they wanted to record some vocals there. And Rita was just going to bring Kelly, Kelly Willard's daughter. She was just going to like babysit. So Rita's in the studio. They're doing these vocals. Something's just not working. Just the blend's not right. And so Kelly Willard says at some point, hey guys, Rita, will you, let Rita, Rita's got a great like alto voice. Can you give her a shot? Give her a try. Oh yeah, yeah. So I think I don't know who took Kelly's baby, but so Rita went in, and sure enough, they just had this cool sound. She's Rita has this sort of airy, alto-y, just thick kind of thing that just is a great blending kind of voice. It, it's not pointed. When you're in, when you're, you got a bunch of voices, you've got pointed voices, and then some that are more thick and airy you know and so you put them together and it's like a nice blend if everybody's pointed then it's you've got 10 lead singers instead of a blend so anyhow that was the beginning and then he had her sing a couple leads on that and then the next album she sang on that and then during that time marty nystrom who wrote as the deer and many other beautiful songs with integrity music um came through to teach on worship and at at the last day's ministries and they said hey Paul will you put a band together we'll do a worship concert with Marty's uh songs so I you know that was I got pegged as that guy and we put rehearse a band and it was great Marty what a, what a beautiful soul what a, and one of the mornings he was there uh before he taught they had asked me hey will you lead worship a couple songs so I did one song called Love to be in your presence with your people. One of the first songs I'd ever written and finished with Ed Carr. So at the end of that week, he said, hey, that song you guys did the other day, it was, is that yours? Do you have any other songs? And so in our head, we're laughing because we're like, yeah, we had like at that point for about the past year, we'd been writing and demoing. So we're like, here's 50 songs. And I didn't hear anything back for a few months, but eventually uh, you know i mean whatever i don't even know what my expectations were but i got a call and he said will you come to mobile we want to i remember having a dinner with don moen and marty nystrom and garrett gusterson and mike coleman and it was like we want to uh want to we like some of these songs we want to would you be interested in doing a live worship album and i was like i mean are you kidding like it was so far beyond what i ever imagined like you know, maybe you want Kelly to do it or Lenny, maybe you're talking and I'll, I'll back them up. But it was like for me to do that. So, yeah. So me and Rita. And that was like one of the first sort of albums they ever did. It was more guitar based and a, like a husband and a wife. Um, there was sort of a mix there and Kelly sang on it and Lenny, Ed Carr. And it was called He is Faithful. And so that opened up doors. I'm getting to the Maranatha. So then I did another album about two years later. They signed me as a as a writer with integrity and, and Ed, they, they were starting to do scripture memory albums and they had these live worship projects that they needed new songs for. So um, we signed a, a, a publishing thing. We're still living in our mobile home. It was like a $600 a month advance. I was like, wow, they're gonna, you're going to give me $600 a month advance? Like, you know, at the time, I don't know what our annual income was. It was not, not much, but we had two kids now by then. And uh, so we were doing that. And um, that's when, after three albums with Maranatha, oh, then they did a few more, but basically there was a falling out with the Maranatha and the praise band a little bit. And so, um, so the Maranatha people came to me and said, um, hey, could you and Rita, would you be interested in producing like the next praise band? Even though I was signed with integrity, song-wise, I thought, well, I mean, uh, I guess. So the first one we did was called Rock of Ages. That was a song of Rita's. And uh, that was the title of the Praise Band 7. And I hired a bunch of, you know, Carl Albrecht on drums and Don Harris. These were all my buddies, guys that I'd known, played with, uh, with a few other guys too. Jamie Harville, uh, 
who co-wrote uh, Ancient of Days. Um, and yeah, some singers, we kind of had that, that sound, that praise band sound. So we did praise band six, uh, seven, eight, nine, and 10. And uh, meanwhile, still trying to work with integrity, still trying to be the, local, the worship pastor at church, raising our kids. It's a crazy busy time. Probably too committed, probably overcommitted, probably, probably burned through some adrenaline during that time. I want to play a few songs from that first Integrity Project. Um, one of the things that I that I've learned from you through the years is, uh, you know, that we just we sing our prayers and we pray our songs, and uh, I think I think you can really hear that in the lyric of this song. Like when I hear the lyric of uh, "This is going to be changed my heart, oh God," but when I hear that lyric, I'm like that. It feels like a prayer. It just feels like someone transcribed someone's prayer and set music to it. So I, I just want to play a clip here that we can listen to together and get your reaction. So when I when I hear that vocal blend, it sounds like Kelly singing alto, and is that Lenny singing the tenor part? Yes. Yeah. That, that, Lenny, that, and Ed, that Lenny and Ed, Kelly and Rita. Yeah, that was a magical blend on a lot of those integrity recordings. Just uh, those combinations were great, man. When you hear that, that that's 1992, so that's 30 years ago. What do you think of that? What does that song take you back to when you hear that? Well, I was, first of all, that is 100% Ed Carr. I mean, I remember helping him like with the demo of that, but I remember that's how we began writing songs at our church. Ed would say, maybe after a time of worship, there was the freedom to say, you know, um, and he, he was very like introverted too. So it was when he would take that little risk and say, hey, I had a little a song, a little prayer song before we kind of finished worship this morning. I just just want to share this if you want to sit down. And I remember him just playing that on piano. Change my heart, oh God. Fill me with your spirit. Oh, man, take away desires that drive me far from you. Whisper from your word. Help my heart to hear it. We used to tease and say all oh, it's the alliteration song. You know, whisper from your word. Help my heart to hear it. It's great writing, though. It's Fill me great. with desire to follow. I know. No matter where you lead me, no matter how I'm tested, I believe you can help me grow and help me to obey. Yeah, I mean, it just I'm, I'm reminded of what an influence Ed was on me in those the very early years writing-wise, just having the courage to just step out with an idea, just step out and sing a prayer idea and not feel like it had to be all 100% put together. There was many of those. I, man, there was a flashback. Some that never made it to recordings. That, that was just the the culture at our church was to share a little prayer song, a prayer idea. So then that gave me courage and confidence that over that next year or two, again, as I would get those moments and go, hey, guys, can we just sing this prayer back to the Lord? Let's just sing this over again. Let, yeah, let's try that. Let's just sing that again, that little, that phrase. Let's just sing this again, you know, many of those kind of moments. There's another song I want to play here and uh, also off of He is Faithful. And um, I know this is one, of, you've told me this is like one of Don Moen's favorite songs of yours, but it's also one of mine. Uh, just the melody is just so beautiful. This is No Eye is Seen.
What a beautiful melody, Paul. It's so gorgeous. Hmm. Hmm. What do you remember about that uh, that song? And it's obviously stirring something in you. What is what is it? What memories does that bring back? Um, just how how just there's such an innocence there. We weren't trying to write hit songs. Yeah, there, there was nothing to like shoot for, if you will. Like, oh, maybe this will get on this album, or maybe we'll pitch this to this artist. There was no, there was nowhere in our thinking. It was just writing something that was like a, a sincere prayer to the Lord. Yeah. And that's based on scripture, of course. And I remember our little cheap piano in our mobile home uh, with two little kids <laughs> and Ed Carr being at the house and him at the piano <clears throat> And Reed and I, and like working on different harmonies, and, and I'd have my guitar. I mean, you can hear a lot of that James Taylor influence in my, so if, just from the music side. That's funny, as I hear some of the acoustic guitar stuff, I remember being very much kind of influenced by that style, James. Yeah, it's it, it sort of translated well in the in the worship world, you know, in the worship production. Anyway, yeah, just a beautiful. It's it's moving to me because of uh, where, yeah, just the innocence of just writing songs that would honor the Lord, that please His heart, that would uh, put a prayer on someone's lips, and mm. be encouraged by you know. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Paul, during those early years, you and Rita sang not just on your own projects, but as you've kind of alluded to, you sang on other projects. We talked about the Maranatha stuff, but you also sang on a lot of integrity projects. And uh, I know me and you were just kind of having a, a fun laugh because <laughs> I was screen sh sh shooting uh, images of you singing on like Ron Cannoli albums and, and all this other stuff. And the joy on your face. Um, oh. You just, you just look at you back in the day and it's just like, I'm so, I I can't, I'm here. I can't believe I get to be up here. This is awesome. That's, you just see it on your face. Is that how you felt? Absolutely. <laughs> I feel that way most of my life. Just, I just felt that way, to be honest. Like, just waiting for someone to tap me on the shoulder and go, um, sorry, you need to leave now. <laughs> Um, when you think I would have said, I understand. Thank you. Yeah, I'm gone. Yeah. No, yeah. So of course, surrounded by these incredibly talented singers, like LA session singers, Lenny LeBlanc, Matthew Ward, who's like the Stevie Wonder of of the early worship, you know, Christian yeah. music. Um, and then there I am with sort of the meat and potatoes, sort of blue collar, like I'll, I'll get the melody or the tenor. <laughs> <laughs> Count on me for that. When you think of those other projects that you and Rita were a part of, which ones stood out to you as, man, we had a great time doing this, or I remember a funny story from that, or I was so elated to be a part of that one. Are there, are there ones that stand out? I mean, the Ron Cannoli ones were, of course, very special because it was every, all the bells and whistles. I mean, horns and trumpets and 500 voice choir and it's massive. If you sing out, if anybody watching this, you have no idea what we're talking about. If you can Google Ron Cannoli sing out recording and just watch some of that video. And it was just jubilation and, and diversity of styles and music and musicianship. And Abe, Abe there's bass solos, Abe Laboreal, and there's uh, horns. And so just so different than now. I mean, there's, you know, it's fine now. I, I like what's going on now too. But um, yeah, other projects come to mind. Uh, Don Harris started producing stuff like uh, In Christ Alone, where Marty Nystrom he led that particular project. And I remember that. Um, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His love for us. That song had so many great scripture songs. Um, it, it had, well, there's another one. Um, let me just think of it real quick. 
Um, speak to one another, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Play and make music in your heart to the Lord. <laughs> You know, and those songs, um, they would make great kids' albums. Songs. There was joy. That's interesting. Yeah. As you say that, there was joy there. You know, there was definitely, you know, we can look back and it could almost sound cheesy, and yet it didn't at the time. There was, there was a joy about it that was so refreshing. Um, and then there's some ballads on there that are, are just really some of the best songs. So In Christ Alone stands out, uh, one or two of the Bob Fitz projects, He Will Come and Save You. Oh, what a fantastic project. You. That whole project was great. We got to be part of that. Uh, a Don Moen project, Rivers of Joy, I think it was called. Yeah, um, that had the first recording of Shout to the Lord on it. You're right. You're right. And we, I think we recorded that at Focus on the Family in Colorado Springs. And uh, also, uh, it was fun because one of, uh, one of the guys in my little worship team in Texas, he was a YWAM kid at the time, and he wrote a song called uh, Sing for Joy. Actually, it might have been a, another album of Don, Sing for Joy. If we call to him, he will answer us. If we run to him, he will run to us. And of course, it was sing for joy to God our strength. Anyway, it's, it was really strong at the time i remember that song a lot remind me who wrote that um lamont hebert yes and then uh he another song he did that integrity regret. i'm here to meet with you that's right come and meet with me as i wait you make and then i was a little instrumental in helping lamont get that and a whole album recorded by Integrity. That was really fun. You this, know, our, our, this YWAM young guy who was writing these simple songs that were so, so good. And Integrity ended up recording a whole project. Our friend, uh, our friend Jody Cross always made a, a silly dad joke with Meet With Me. He would always go, yeah, the butcher song, you know, Meet With Me, Meet, come on, come on, Meet With Me. Oh no. <laughs> Just like so bad, but I remember those songs. Those uh, "Meet with Me" was a big, big song. Great, great opener. Um, you know, you you'd kind of alluded to this before. Actually, before I get to this question, let me let me uh, let me play another clip uh, here real quickly. Okay. So this is uh, this is off your second uh, project with Integrity. This is uh, "Rise Up and Praise Him." <laughs> So, so we kind of mentioned this before, but if there was any doubt that acoustic worship was going to be a thing, it was it was totally made manifest in in this project. And and there's such a shift, um, you know, from He Is Faithful to this production. And I I have this theory where when you record songs with just um, analog instruments, nothing that is too crazily synthesized. They, they, they tend, not all the time, but many a time, they, they tend to weather the decades a little bit better. And when I listen to that song, I'm like, there's not much about that arrangement that I would, I would even change today. It's rock and roll, man. It's rock and roll. Yes. And, and so, you know, my question for you is like, did you, did you notice that shift in the 90s that was happening from piano based to acoustic driven music? Or were you just kind of just doing your thing and trying to be faithful and just being who you were? Or was that something you kind of took note of and were like, 
Yeah, this is okay. Th this is cool because what is coming into vogue is kind of like my default and who I am. Yeah, no, I wish, again, it wasn't like it is nowadays where you can kind of eavesdrop on everything come up all over the place. I mean, you didn't really know what was going on all over the world worship wise. You know, there was, if, if you will, I mean, occasionally a project would come out and you'd be like, oh, wow, that's really different. But I think a lot of it had to do with just my, my background by just default was sort of a club guy, a five piece rock band playing records and clubs and just, you know, you got electric guitar, bass, keyboards, and um, I wasn't trying to prove anything. It was just sort of like joyful. Like to me, that's just one of those uh, grooves that like, bam, ba -na 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 -na. Na, 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 na. Hey, baby, oh, everything is all right. Uptight, clean out of sight. You know what I mean? Just that. Bah, 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 bah. So I'd, a lot of times I'd start with that sort of like, man, that that's a groove that I could see people like doing one of those kind of things. So then I'd think, look for a scripture, maybe Psalm 95, come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let's shout aloud. Yeah, let's shout aloud. Let's see. Rise up and praise him. That's good. Rise up and praise him. Yeah. He deserves our love. You know, that kind of, a lot of us, that's how we write. Like that thing of like, oh, the church is going to love this, you know, thinking our church. And then we recorded that with our church. And I found, I came across somebody who has a VHS video of that entire thing that I will send to you. I will get that. I just stumbled across it recently and uh can't wait to see that and and it, you were telling me like it that album like what you hear is like no overdubs it's like it. what what you hear is what what was happening that night it's just a bunch of tube gear i remember paul mills rented down below the 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 platform it was it looked like a like a nasa space thing it was just all this tube gear and then just five pieces and, you know, a B3, that's Chris Springer on the B3 organ, just killing yeah. it. Carl Albrecht, just, and again, we weren't trying to be like, let's do rock and roll. And, and once in a while, I'd get pushback from people in my church when I would, like, introduce a song, you know, before this album even. And I tried to, like, go to just kind of be humble about it and go, uh, you know, they'd be like, we need to do more hymns. And some of this stuff just sounds like a nightclub. I remember this one. We were in the parking lot. Uh, pulling up we we were a little late for service and we could feel the thumping of the bass guitar from the parking lot and like then they gave, me, church. <laughs> and they gave me a bill gothard series on music or something uh, anyway it was so interesting i tried to find that i remember meeting with the elders saying look i'm not trying to i have no agenda here trying to make us a rock and roll or anything I will learn more hymns. I also know, though, that it says, I remember pointing this out in, in like Psalm 7, it says in King James, it says, set to a wild, passionate beat. What do I do with that? I'm just saying, what does that mean? Why did David bother to put that in there? But in other words, it was like whoever the hymn writer, the psalm writer was um, in the preamble, if you will, it says set to a wild, passionate beat. I mean, I don't know, just saying that there were probably some songs that were like, boom, 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 <laughs> boom, boom, boom. You know, they had the trumpets. <laughs> I don't know. Or boom, 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 boom. We did it. Uh, year, then a couple of years later, Ed and I wrote a song, Praise the Lord, all nations. It was like a super thick, heavy African beat. Um, and I just remember using that to justify it, but not in a private way. Like we're going to do whatever we want here. It was more like, I understand your concern. We're going to try to keep things balanced. It's not, everything's going to be rock and roll, but sometimes, you know, I think it's okay for us to, it says shout to the Lord. We go, Hey, something about like getting out of our composure and just like, yeah, you know, I think that's why it's in the word. It's like to get us out of our heads. And to like feel and experience something. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I would be amiss not to play um, another song from that project. And you were talking about, and and we all know just how much of an incredible writer your wife Rita is. And you'd mentioned the song earlier, but I just want to play a little clip of Rock of Ages, which was the second track off yeah. the same project. 
Yeah. I'm gonna sing for joy. Let us shout aloud for our salvation. Yeah. 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 Rock and roll. Rock and roll. You got the harmonica in there. You got Matthew Ward's unmistakable vocals in the background. Um, wow, that just that that seems like that was just a fun recording. Super fun. The energy just off the charts. Again, live in the moment. What we get, we'll see what we get. Well, here we go. Push record. Boom. <laughs> I, I mean, love there's, that. there's some sweet moments on the record too. Like, like there were unplanned, just some sweet. Uh, there's a song called uh, "I Lift a Love Song Up to You from My Heart to Yours." I lift a love song up to you. I mean, it just it goes on in a beautiful. I, but I remember again, that was one of those moments in church, just for any songwriters, like from my heart to yours, where you'd almost finish a worship time and say, Lord, just this morning, just from our hearts to yours, receive our praise. And just a phrase like that, and I'd say, you know, I'd just play the chord that was in my hand and go, maybe just before we close, what if we just from my heart to yours? Let's try that. From my heart to yours how about um we lift a love song up to you we lift a love song up to you from our hearts and then we would just go like go back into the band would join in that would be like five ten minutes we would just sort of get lost in god you know that's how things kind of took shape back then it's great Okay, a couple more questions about the First Love Project. Um, you know, you've just talked about how that was just such a, you know, exciting season of ministry. I was curious to know, between He is Faithful and First Love, there were six years. Was that because of just your commitments as a songwriter for integrity and what was going on with Maranatha? Or was there, was there any other reason why it took six years between both of those projects? Very interesting, actually. Uh, I've never, I've never thought about that i never realized that what is it, is it really well from 92 was it 96 i think that's four years right uh 98 was first love are you sure i'm pr i'm pretty sure I, I i will look it up here really quickly i i could be wrong um let's just take a quick look that here twice this year it's a joke um first love 1998 interesting so six years yeah, I guess again, it, maybe it, it's it, it it proves that it was not like I couldn't believe I got to do. He is faithful. I never pictured myself as like an artist. That just wasn't a thing back in the day, per se. You know, um, unless you were like a CCM, like you know, there were some people that were doing that. There was Twilight Paris. There was Stephen Curtis coming along, but I didn't see myself. I was a church guy, so um, I think. What happened in those years, there was a lot of writing going on. Um, 
there was a lot of writing going on for scripture memory projects for other artists. Yep. I was doing more writing, more uh, uh, starting to do some teaching at YWAM and conferences a little bit, just getting my feet wet, but I'm surprised it's, it was that long. It, it didn't feel like, oh, I, I guess I'll never get to do another album again. Um, that's interesting. Very interesting. Was it, was it recorded at your church in Lindale, Texas? Well, so our church was only so big. And we thought, man, wouldn't it be fun if we could open it up to more people? So our church had already, we knew these songs. We were singing these in our church. And we went to um, uh, a theater in Tyler, which was like 30 minutes away, downtown Tyler, Texas. Yeah. And it was a something theater. And it was just kind of a nicer venue. And more people were able to join, had a, a balcony. And I remember that's where the guy, the video that he took, he's, he's, you can tell he's up on a balcony and he's like zooming in with an old VHS. And it's just one camera, but it does capture, you see people down below standing. On, and um, yeah, yeah. What was the name of that? It was, I just remember being really honored that we could use that and record there. And Paul, Paul Mills uh, produced that album. He did. He did. And as I'm listening back, man, the mix on that. I mean, there's only one electric guitar. So it's that was Glenn wow. Pierce. That's Glenn Pierce on electric. No okay. overdub. So it just he's just got a great tone. There's one acoustic. There's one B3 or piano. Uh, there's a drum kit and a bass player. That's it. I mean, it's old school. It's like, you know, watching that the Beatles, uh, the get back thing when you, you're reminded like, oh, yeah, that's what bands were. You just sort of. And when you listen closer, there's not a ton of overdubs. Yeah. At least on that album on get back. But um, let it be, I should say. Now, um, the other thing I noticed about the first love project is, you know, you, you covered two songs by Delirious, Martin Smith. And can you speak to how that music was how it impression it had made an impression upon you and your exposure to that and you know were you a delirious fan where did you hear those oh, that's what's ironic or funny and i can say it because i love martin and, and I, I mean no disrespect i'd never heard of them i've heard i heard a few people talking about oh, oh it was integrity chris springer came to me he was a and r and he said paul we want to do this album but we want to we want you to lead a couple of these songs from this band in uk called delirious and uh it's here's live in the can. I just remember that. It was yes. like a cool little uh, the silver tin. Yeah. 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 And so I was a little bit as a songwriter, kind of like, to be honest, a little bummed, like, well, I kind of just want to do my songs, like sort of. At did, the you time, I, less, did you more or less have the restriction over to choose the songs for your projects? No, no. I mean, that's that's your relationship with a record company and an A&R person is like yeah. you helping do it as a group get some objectivity of like, Paul, oh, I think this would be worth doing. This is important. This is so um, I could sing of your love forever had never been recorded live. It was just Martin's studio version. And so they pushed for like, man, I think this would be a good song for you to cover. And it's funny in the beginning, I remember thinking it's kind of a tough melody. How are people going to be able to over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart. I mean, now he's like, of course, it's so easy. But at the time, you know, we were like, as the deer panther, da, 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 da. you know, everything was a bit on like a meter. And all of a sudden you've got this over the mountains and the sea, your river runs. With I'm just trying to picture how's a choir going to sing that? You know? So um, anyway, it was great to do that. I, I'm so, you know, in hindsight, of course. And for many years, people are like, oh, love your music. Your favorite song is I Could Sing of Your Love Forever. It's like, yeah, I'll tell Martin. Also, uh, <laughs> I used to get, I used to get uh, on He Is Faithful. I was did the first live album or live version of. Um, Lord, I Lift Your Name on High. Yeah, right. So I used to get that for many years. Oh, I love your music. Uh, especially Lord, I Lift Your Name on High. That's my favorite. Great. I'll pass that on. Thanks. That's an honor, Rick. Yes. So, yeah, then, Oh, Lead Me, beautiful song, Martin's, and, oh, oh yeah. the happy song. We did the happy song, which was, yeah, again, so fun three on song. there. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's great. Well, I know I give you a hard time about this, but I'm going to put you on the spot. That That is one awesome vest you have on the cover of that record, on the back. Tell, tell me about, does the vest still exist? <laughs> well, 
Uh, no, I have no idea where it is. That would be- <laughs> Twas the fashion at the time to wear a vest, a multicolored. Yeah. It's like Joseph in the amazing multicolored vest, worship leader vest. It's like my superpowers happen when I wear this vest. <laughs> I, in the early days when I started connected with Marinette or with Integrity, uh, Martin Neister, I did, after I did He is Faithful, about a year later, they wanted to do these worship seminars uh seminars for worship they were called and they wanted to do a tour in new zealand so we did christchurch auckland sydney brisbane and melbourne and while we were there and so marty nystrom would lead one night and then the next night i would lead and there was that sort of uh again i couldn't believe i got to be part of it and then there was teaching involved training and i think that's maybe where that those seeds were planted to me like yeah there's a need for this i should do more of this um but yeah, so that's where I found those two sweaters. Those, 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 it was in Australia. It was like kind of like I think Bill Cosby was just starting to wear them too, right? Oh man! Or especially the vest. I know, I know. I get a lot of grief for it, but oh well, it's fine. I remember Carl Albrecht's wife tapping me on the shoulder one time because I think I worked for the Ron Canoli video. I worked for my stuff. You, you wore it everywhere in the night. Everywhere. It was your magic multicolor uniform. It was like a uniform. <laughs> I don't want to think about one. I'm not a fashion guy. So I remember her saying, Paul, and like looking at me like with her eyes and said, listen, I love you, but as your friend, you need to retire that vest. <laughs> Thank you, Leanne. Thank and you. Going, really? Really? <laughs> Wow. What's wrong with it? Anyway, yeah, funny. Oh, okay. I want to play another song. Um, this is a really, uh, in, I know you don't think in terms of yourself as an artist or a career. So, um, you know, uh, but but this is a song um, that the Lord used globally. Um, and because the Lord used it, because the Lord blew wind into it, um, I, I don't think it would be uh, an exaggeration to say that it it. it, it expanded your platform of ministry that he had trusted you with and it was recorded on first love uh, this is open the eyes of my heart that song I think of how um, worship songs for many believers are flags in their lives they're flags of areas where God took more territory in their hearts they're flags uh, that remind them of commitments and recommitments and uh, I know that that song that simple simple song has been a flag for millions of Christians Um, that is a song that shifted the landscape of modern worship and really became uh, an anthem. And uh, I, you've told it to me before, but I just love the simplicity and the purity of, of how you wrote that. Can you share the story behind that again? Yeah, in a nutshell, um, there was a pastor that used to, um, heard on the radio originally when we were brand new believers, Rita and I, he, uh, he would occasionally be on, as a guest on this AM radio station, Dr. Bruce Morgan. And he would do these home meetings around New Jersey and Philadelphia. 
Rita and I occasionally, whenever we could, would, would go to one of these home meetings, there'd be 20 people in there and we would get his cassette tapes and he was like a real father in the Lord to us. Uh, he actually, when he was a young man, I was, had, had been exposed to A.W. Tozer, had kind of done some events with him and just, uh, so yeah, Dr. Bruce Morgan and just one of the home meetings that he, uh, that he, you know, he said, well, all right, guys, let's, let's, let's get started. Let's get our Bibles. Let's, let's pray. Lord, tonight, as we look into your word, we just pray you open the eyes of our hearts and give us insight and wisdom into your word, blah, 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 you know, that kind of thing. Amen. You know, and I just remember writing that down in my journal. I was always a note taker, just writing you know, reams of notes from when he would teach, but just that, you know, and I'd put like a little music symbol next to sometimes a, a phrase. It would be like, oh, that, that almost sounds like you could sing that, you know. And then over the ensuing months, um, you know, during our prayer times, where just in unstructured prayer times at our church on a Friday night, maybe, you kind of run out of songs in the key of E, or, you know, as a band, you're just kind of providing some background music, you're, you're, you're singing a song, but then you also just want to you know, you want people to just have a chance to digest what they're singing and praying. And just so you're, and I just remember, I'd bring that out once in a while. I'm just sort of, open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. We want to see you. We want to see you. And just sort of, uh, yeah, it was never like, I'm sitting down, I'm writing a song. It was just that sort of, prayerful, calling upon the Lord. God, tonight we want to see you. God, we really do. And I did that enough. After a while, I thought, gosh, I should think about a B section for that. Like, uh, it could be a song. So I was thinking, all right, I want to see you. I want to see you. Okay, who saw the Lord? Isaiah, John, like who actually saw? I see the Lord. I want to see you. Uh, I go to Isaiah, and you're like, I see the Lord, and he is high and lifted up, and the train of his robe is filling. So I say, okay, so I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, and the train of your robe is filling the temple. No, 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 it's clumsy, a little, a little in the mouth. Uh, that high and lifted up, I'm just imagining, you know, like, like staring at the sun, like shining in the light of your glory. And, and then a lot of our prayers in that season was, God, pour out your spirit, Lord. Oh, God, you know, pour out your spirit in this place. God, we call upon you. You know, that, that sort of prayer meeting crying out to God. So it's pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Such a simple, really simple, because in my mind, it's just like, oh, this is something we'll, we can sing at church, we'll sing at my church because we'd sang that first bit as like a prayerful refrain, you know, um, just felt like any other song. I remember going to the guy, Kurt Caulfield. He was at a church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He reminds me that I did a weekend there, Rita and I, and I played this for him. And he said, I want you to lead it this Sunday, teach it this Sunday. So he thinks that there is a, it exists somewhere. Like the first time he wants to talk to one of his, uh, Anyway, it was a long time ago, but anyway, wouldn't that be fun to sort of find like, hey guys, so we're going to take a chance here and just do something brand new. You don't know it, but it's easy to pick up. Try to sing along with this. And... I love it. Again, there's like a purity and an innocence to that and just kind of like, no, no show here. Just, just wanting to sing this as a prayer to the Lord in this moment. I love that. No, I'm not trying to over. I'm not trying to be like uh, Mr. Humble Guy either. Honestly, I'm not trying to, yeah. like, oh gee shucks or something. Honestly, I would be honest because as time went on, I have wrestled with you know going to Nashville and you've got your stuff and you've got your ideas and you got this. You're going to meet with this writer and that name and that guy. Yeah. And it's like it feels a little slick and a little bit. And you really got to like oh you know like try to get back to that original place of like. Like uh, my, my pastor, there's a, there's a scripture in Ezekiel that says, shake your hands of a bribe. It's, in, it's maybe like out of context, but it's like the idea of just like shaking your hands, like just shaking off any sense of like, oh, maybe this will get on this project or let's write a song that might be, it's like, there's nothing wrong with that per se, but always trying to get back to that more 
innocent place of where I don't care. I'll say that to the co-writer. We've got a couple hours. You know, let's just write something that we feel like is going to really bless the Lord's heart that maybe would help other people worship. Um, God, we don't care if anybody else ever hears this song. We just want to write it. Anyway, that, that, you're always trying to do this mental, psychological, spiritual gymnastics once you've gained some experience because you, you sort of know a little bit of like, well, we could do this, that, 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 that. But it's like there's nothing like tapping into just that place where your hands are open. You're not trying to get something from God. You're just coming with an open heart, with a, with a simple prayer idea. That person has a prayer idea, maybe, and you ultimately you just want to, when you're done, go, man, this this feels like an, something that honors the Lord. This feels prayerful. This feels. Yeah, I love yeah. that. I love that. And you know what? I want to shift and talk a little bit about songwriting for a few minutes. Before we do, you mentioned a name, and of course, my my antenna goes up when I hear this name, just because. I'm a big uh, fan of Twyla Paris. I think she is one of the greatest uh, worship lyricists of all time. How beautiful. We will glorify. He exalt. He's exalted. It goes on and on and on. Um, I know that she was involved with YWAM and that you had proximity to YWAM. Did you ever connect with Twyla or, or sit under her worship leadership? I was aware. So the, the YWAM base in Tyler, in Lindale, they all, a lot of those kids and that staff would plug into our church. A lot of those people... All right, it was run by uh, Fran Paris, Fran and Leland Paris. So Leland's brother ran the Arkansas base, and that is where Twyla, Twyla's the daughter of, of the base in Arkansas. So yeah, I think her I father's name is Oren, Oren Paris. Okay, exactly. Yes, yeah. yes. So I just knew that they had a connection, and I was friends with Leland and Fran, and they came to our church, and uh, they were sweet and encouraging, and it was early years, and just the whole spirit of YWAM, Youth with a Mission. Uh, but I would say not personally, you know, when Twyla occasionally would come and do something, and through Kelly, it would just be high, you know, high on Paul, and very high. But we, we never really got to yeah. know each other well or write together or work together. But she was, of course, very gracious and um, gracious and just unpretentious, yeah. Yeah, totally. Well, let's talk about songwriting for a couple of minutes here. If you could boil it down, I know this is a tough question, but if you could boil it down to just like one or two or three things, what are the characteristics, Paul, of an enduring worship song? Hmm. Uh, well, is it memorable comes to mind, you know? Um, and what is that? That's a mystery. If we, if we could just like, sort of like crank that all day long, we would, we would be doing it, right? Um, there's, there's a, a, as the French would say, a je ne sais quoi. There's a mystery to what makes a song memorable. Is it repetition? Uh, you know, you know, we talked about, you know, it's a difficult melody, but because it's repeated so often, it sticks in there and kind of, you know, kind of, yeah, and there's even some there's some tonal painting even in that word over the mountains and the sea. It's right. doing what the notes are doing. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So yeah, I mean you're, you know, I wrote a whole book on songwriting that people could check out. God songs. In terms <laughs> of, I probably have a list of seventeen things that make a song enduring. So, but when you ask me, put me on the spot. You know, what makes a song? I, for sure, is it is it memorable? You know. Um, simple but not simplistic um is there an emotional quality about the song is there something that's emotional is there a universal emotional aspect to it that people can relate to that people uh um, you know I, I don't know you played open the eyes if i just look at that what what is it about maybe is there an urgency there in the music a little bit of an urgency uh it's not really a, like an up, up tempo, happy, clappy song. It's more of a, it's a bit of an intensity, like a, like I want to see you, God, open the eyes of my, I want to see you, like I'm desperate. It's almost that sort of a, and I think. Um, I also think like that it's another great example in the B section of just fantastic tonal painting. 
in the melody out just outlines a chord to see you high and lifted up the melody is ascending on those words uh -huh. high and lifted up you know right. it, it, it wouldn't have the same effect if it was to see you high and lifted up right. you know right. but the tonal painting is yeah. just uh you know and that's i know that comes naturally to you but i think that's part of what makes that song lift in that section uh-huh Again, you stumble on things. You like to take some credit. There was no thought to that, of course. You just, you write enough. There was many, many songs we wrote and demoed. This is important for any songwriter to know that, you know, we're, we're kind of, you're picking out some of the highlights here, but there were many songs that no one will ever hear. More songs, yeah. I have 400 songs recorded and like with CCLI, and that reminds me that at least twice as many songs were written and demoed and never recorded. So that's that's a lot of songs. And that kind of gets me into my second question about songwriting, because um, I think you're answering it. What are some of the disciplines that you practice as a songwriter that you feel have equipped you well and helped you to actually grow in that skill set? I'm sure that like keep going and keep writing is is one of those things. Yeah, now I feel funny for saying that because I don't, I'm not a numbers person. I don't, I, I, I hate that. It's like the, the scripture, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. I don't subscribe to CCLI. I, I've told integrity for years. Like, I don't want to know where, if my song's at 17 or 25 or 2000, or it's like, I don't, I kind of don't want to know. Like, <laughs> because yeah. if I knew, if I start paying attention, because I did, there was a season where I paid too much attention to that and it can start to poison the well kind of affect maybe the way you, you think and write. And, and I, I didn't like that. I didn't like how that affected me. And I, I, I still have to occasionally just, just, I don't want to know. I don't need to know that. That's not important. Um, right. That's, so, uh, but anyway, I threw that mainly as an encouragement. I just wanted to say that there were so many more songs that at the time, Ed and I, and then sometimes just myself, like, write the song, believe in it, think think so much of it that we would go through the trouble of making a demo, spending the money, and then put that on the dat tape, mailing it into integrity, or FedExing it, waiting for that phone call to say, this is a great song, we want to record it next week. And just never getting that call and following up, hey, what would you guys think of that? Yeah, it was okay. It's good, Paul. It just didn't quite kind of fit the project. Oh, okay. I mean, Paul, is, there, of, is there a particular song that you really felt was a decent song from back in the day that never got recorded? Sorry, helicopter. City living here. Um, um, yeah, well, there was one song, it's funny that I, it did get recorded, but I felt almost like I believed in it so much that I recorded it a second time on another album. It was called Little Thing. <laughs> I thought, Surely people just didn't hear this because if they really heard it, man, they would love this song. <laughs> I was so like sort of proud of the lyrics, if you will. Uh, I remember it was called The Way. And uh, and we were driving to church. My kids were smaller in the back. And I'm driving to church. And there was this beautiful, as we've seen, sky where the clouds were a certain way. And the sun just happens to be shining through. And you see those like almost th these uh, light things coming down out of a cloud it's like glorious right so as i'm driving i'm like hey hey guys guys look look check it out look at look at look at the sky just look at the way the light is breaking through the clouds and the beams of light are shining all around and as soon as i said that i'm like the way the sun breaks through the clouds beams of light shining all around i thought what's another thing the way the ocean meets the sand, waves of blue come crashing in. And then finally, uh, the, the way, uh, something, something. And then of course, I see you, I feel you like the wind against my face. I want to follow you more and more each day because you are the way, you are the way. So I just thought it was so fun, like using the way uh, as an adjective or an adverb, and then two different ways. I just, I, there was something about that song. 
the way the thunder, the way the, the thunder shakes the earth. Uh, anyway, bro, you can go back and listen. Uh, forgive me, anybody. You can erase this part. No, no, it's it's great. It's great. Paul, what are some of the disciplines that you have regularly practiced um, as a songwriter? Like, what are some of the things that you're regularly doing that you have found help lead you to writing good lyric, writing good melody? In my most prolific time of writing back in the day was when, when I made a commitment to meet somebody at the church. Usually it was Ed. So before Zoom, before ever anybody ever asked me to co-write or go to Nashville, just putting on the calendar um, that I'm going to meet with this person. It's my personality too. I'm much better with like another person than just some people would be like, they want to be by themselves for six hours at a piano and you know, uh, I'm a little bit more of a people person. So Ed would be more like that. So Ed would sort of have some of these interesting ideas, uh, but they were unfinished. And then maybe I'd come in, you know, with a couple ideas that were guitar based, but just that commitment to meet with another writer, the accountability of meeting with somebody on a consistent basis, knowing that you can't show up with nothing, you know, you, I mean, you can, but you feel almost... So it puts a little fire under you and it keeps your wheels turning and it keeps a little uh, motivation. It keeps songwriting on your mind, knowing that I have to you know, show up and meet with this person, either in person or, or on a Zoom call. I mean, my last project, Behold Him, was a, that was written 100% over Zoom. I had never even met Mitch uh, when we started writing that song. I never met him. So, but just knowing that you're going to meet with somebody just even this interview meeting with you is like okay i've got i got 10 more minutes i gotta set things up i gotta make sure i, I had to move here because it was running out of power i didn't think ahead that i could possibly run out of battery so I, but yeah so that would be my main thing to writers is uh find somebody that you respect musically and spiritually enough to at least give it a try co-writing thing because and don't be too precious. If you'll notice, most of the great songs being written in the last many years are always co-written. So you know, right? But yeah, once in a while, you could finish a song on your own. That's that's good too if, if you do that. But don't don't be too precious. Maybe you have an ins keep collecting inspired ideas. Keep collecting them. I, my imaginary like bag. I'm putting my like putting these inspired ideas in a, in a little <laughs> in a little bag that I'm going to carry with me to the writing session. You go, Ooh, look at this one. Yeah. But really, you know, usually it's like inspired ideas on your phone, probably, or lyric ideas, wherever you have a way to um, access those, go back and listen to some of those and then filter them out. You some just start to rise at the top. As you go back and listen to an idea you started two weeks ago, you listen to three or four ideas and there's just one that kind of stands out seems to stand out a little more than the others so then and that you know that for me is always the discipline i was you know as you know i'm getting ready to, to move here and I, I i opened a i opened a rubbermaid bin and on the top was a bunch of loose sheets of paper and i looked at them and i'm like oh oh i forgot about that song and i'm like oh i really need to come back to that that had that that had some that had something in it. There, there was yep. something there. But the, the discipline of coming back and taking the rough stone and polishing it, putting it in the tumbler for a little while, letting it sit, yep. taking it back out and whoosh, getting the dust off of it and saying, ah, maybe setting it. Oh, would that look good in a ring or a bracelet or a, you yep. know, that discipline. I remember Brian Dirksen talked about that a lot. It's just the discipline of coming back and rewriting is yeah. the hardest yeah. It's true. There were many times, real quick example, uh, today is the day. Um, I remember, you know, we would do, I would do kids church sometimes like, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord. And I remember thinking, all right, we need a new one. Like we just need enough, we need a new one of those. That was fine. But, and so at one point I had a different translation and it said, today is the day you have made I will rejoice and be glad in it. I thought, David, today is the day. Let's open bell. You have made. Hey, hey. I will rejoice and be glad in it. So I just had that little idea. And I tried several verse things over a year or two at different times. 
and I played for Rita and she's like, yeah. But my real quick is that about two or three years later, I came up with this verse idea, casting my cares aside. And then I thought, oh, this goes good. And Rita was a bit surprised. She's like, I can't believe you. You're still messing with that chorus. Like, I'm surprised. <laughs> but you just came. It was surprising to her that I wouldn't just let it go. And I said, there's something about it I can't let go. It feels, there's something that feels, I can see people singing this. Yeah. It so, stuck with you. It stuck with you. And sure enough. Uh, that's an example of, yeah, of hanging on, as you said, rewriting, rewriting, rewriting. Yeah. Above all, you've heard that story where I had the verse and chorus. We sang a whole completely different chorus at my church for a whole year. People would. And then every time we hit that chorus, I just something in me just thought, man, it's OK. But it's not great. As I as I was as I'm singing, you know, how that is you're leading worship, you're singing, but there's a voice going. This is this is not it, I don't think. And so I kind of took that what, off the shelf. Well, how did the original chorus go? Oh man, I, I envisioned it like a shout to the Lord. So I was like, there's no way to measure what you're worth. And then it was um oh, oh, oh the earth will worship you. Every heart will see your majesty. All the earth will da 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 and declare that you are holy, holy, six minor, Lord of all the earth. Okay, well, let me, uh, I got it loaded all up. All powers. Right. Back the yeah. Let's hear how it turned out. So this is, uh, again, another modern worship kind of shifting song. Uh, this is, and you completed this with your friend Lenny O'Blanc. This is Above All. <clears throat> above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the great example of just like placement of title you know just at that last phrase and uh yeah man I, I remember the first time i heard that song and i'm just like yes that says something that people want to sing hmm. it's great it's great and paul people um people have given you grief over that song too right because does was god really thinking about us or was he thinking about the glory of his son and get into those theological waters how, how have you um responded when people kind of you know maybe see things from a different theological perspective than you do as a songwriter how do you i know you're so gracious in your demeanor but how do you how have you responded to some of those criticisms through the years very defensively <laughs> great insecurity and defensiveness <laughs> um i have a for years i i just i kind of typed it out one time put it on my website it's just yeah. like, it's not like a lot of people it was i, I understand I, I first of all would typically honor them and say you know you were like the bereans in the book of acts and the bereans were you know it was all about they were people of the word of course it's very important that we are biblical and uh um, i said but maybe there's some poetic a little bit of poetic license that's why it's called art music is yeah. is art there's there's an art so 
but but the scriptures that come to mind on this song is God so loved the world that he gave his only son. His motive, his motive was that he loved the world, not the world like the earth, the dirt. He loved you and I. He loved you. He loved me. We always say it corporately, but how, but what is it wrong to personalize it? God so loved me that he sent his only begotten son. Yeah. That whosoever would believe it, there was that, that was his motive that he was thinking of reconciling us to the father also uh in romans 5 you know god demonstrated that his love for us in this and while we were yet sinners christ died for us um it says in hebrews where he was he endured the cross despising the shame the motive was to again that we have peace with god it was to reconcile us to the father so he was thinking of you and me yes the the, the contention is he was thinking of the Father's glory. And I, of course, I'll concede that. Yes, of course. Um, I guess the, the, the intent or the heart behind this particular song is the, the juxtaposition that the, the, the creator of the universe, the, which we just saw, if you, if you saw the new galaxies, there was a picture that just- Oh, I saw that, yeah. The Hubble, the new telescope, that just- uh, Incredible. Some of the first images of just galaxies, beyond galaxies. So it's like that God, you know, above all, we're making all these declarations. There's no way to even measure or count. And then that same God subjected himself to crucifixion. And uh, he was crucified, rejected alone, like a rose that's been trampled on the ground. That image, you know, he took the fall. He took our sin upon himself. He took our shame, our sin. And he thought of us. He thought of God so loved the world that he sent his son. He thought of us. Above all, you know, again, you know, that as a songwriter, it's just right there, just the, just to be able to bookend the chorus, you know, sure. the bookend the sure. song. Is it a little poetic license? I, I don't feel like it's heresy. No. And so I've said, you know, there are many other songs you can sing. You don't have to sing this. Or what I've done, and I do this actually, the last time I sing this chorus, every time now, I'll say, you took the fall and thought of me. So we place you above all. And I've said for years, like, that's just a way, if you want to do the song, just you thought of me, so we place you above all. 